Welcome to Reading the Room, a literary podcast featuring author interviews and discussions with bookish content creators. I am your host, Jalen, also known as The Bar and the Bookcase on YouTube. Today, I am so thrilled to be joined by Al Nash, author of Deliver Me, available today from Unnamed Press. Elle Nash is a writer that I am incredibly excited by, and I've been, I read her book Gag Reflex last summer, and it really was one of the most original and singular pieces of fiction that I read that year. And I remember around this time that Elle Nash posted about this book, Deliver Me, coming out. And I've had her on my radar ever since, and when I finally picked it up in the lead-up to Spooky Season, I was completely floored by this book. I love Elle Nash as a writer because I feel like she pushes the envelope while being original and also just confident in her storytelling and her writing. Once you start one of her books, you can't really put it down, and her work just really speaks to my horror-loving heart. And to briefly introduce Deliver Me, at a meatpacking facility in the Missouri Ozarks, Dee Dee and her co-workers kill and butcher 40,000 chickens in a single shift. The work is repetitive and brutal, with each stab and cut a punishment to her hands and joints, but Dee Dee's more concerned with what's happening inside her body. After a series of devastating miscarriages, Dee Dee has found herself pregnant, and she is determined to carry the child to term. Dee Dee fled the Pentecostal church years ago, but judgment follows her in the form of regular calls from her mother whose raspy voice urges Dee Dee to quit living in sin and marry her boyfriend, Daddy, an underemployed ex-con with an insect fetish. With the child on the way, at long last, Dee Dee can bask in her, her mother's and boyfriend's newfound attention. She will matter. She will be loved. She will be complete. And her charismatic teenage crush, Sloane, reappears after a 20-year absence, feeding her insecurities and awakening suppressed desires, Dee Dee fears she will go back to living in the shadows. Neither the ultimate indignity of yet another miscarriage nor Sloane's own pregnancy deters her. She must prepare for the baby's arrival. And Melissa Broder, one of my favorite writers, she also blurred this book, and she says, To read the work of El Nash is to be restored to faith in the wildness, wetness, and visceral power of, of contemporary American fiction. Deliver Me is a barbed liturgy of bugs, babies, meat, the gospel, women lusting women, women lusting men, and the human body. Get saved. And I could not put it better myself. So without further ado, let's get into the discussion with El Nash. So, Elle, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. I've been so stoked about this for a while now because I first discovered you. I told you this yesterday, I think. Um, I saw your event with Melissa Broder and Brontes Purnell, two writers that I love, when you guys are talking about sex writing. Um, and I picked up your book, Gag Reflex, and was just completely blown away. I never read a book like that that was, you know, set in that form, set entirely on live journal. Um, and I was so excited to read this because I knew it was coming out eventually. And I was hoping like in the back of my mind to get you on to talk about it. So this is just, I don't know, cool, a long time coming. And so just thank you so much for coming on today. And I'm so stoked to dive in. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Um, I've loved your like Instagram for a long time too. So it feels really cool to be able to talk to you in that. Um, it's cool you discovered me too through Melissa Broder and Brentez Purnell because I look up to them so much. Like being asked to be on that panel felt like really special. So it's cool that people will like associate me with them, you know, because I look up to them a lot. Yeah. I mean, I saw the incredible Melissa Broder blurb on the jacket. Um, I feel like she, you know, landed exactly what this book is doing. But um, yeah, I'm excited to read her new book too, Death Valley. And so I don't know, you guys are both writers that I love for kind of just diving deeply into the meat of some very, you know, dark topics. We're just kind of going into you know, very visceral experiences. And so this book, I think, is absolutely doing that. So I wanted to just start with, the, you know, the general question of like, Deliver Me, when did you start writing it? And how did you come to writing this book in particular? I started writing Deliver Me in early 2019, late 2018. Like 2018, it was like, I made the decision that I was going to try. I'd been trying to actually like write into like an, another like eating disorder novel because you talked about guy reflex for a while right after my daughter was born. And for some reason, just every time that I got to like the middle part, I just like struggled. Like I just kept stalling. And I I don't know if it was just because, you know, you're in the fugue of like, you know, newborn life. Um, and I just wasn't feeling as sharp. Um, as normal and some part of me was just like okay I'm just gonna like go back to the drawing board and teach myself some basics about fiction that I've never explored you know like like what is a plot like how do you write that like how do people just like you know outline like that's not something I'd ever really done before and so that's that is what I did with deliver me I planned out this idea for about two weeks and then I sat down and then I wrote the entire first draft in like nine weeks um just through like it always had like the ending in mind um and then yeah over the years I just spent like I spent several years like refining the draft um and just trying to get it to a place where it, like it felt I don't know like good to me and it's interesting because when I started it I was like in my mind, I was like, this will just be like my bad, like basic novel. But 
you know, towards the end through all the iterations of the drafts and all that stuff, I actually was like, this actually feels really complex and more dark gleamy than I anticipated. Like I was surprised that I was able to come to a place where I was like, oh, this is actually not bad, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it's incredible. Um, there, as you're saying, there's so many, you know, layers to this book. And as I was reading it, I was not entirely sure where it was going. And it was really surprising um, seeing you add, you know, more layers to the characters and the complexity there that I was just so shocked by the end of it, especially like I did not see that coming and I won't spoil it for readers, but I highly recommend you get there because it's, it's great. Um, and so, I mean, in terms of like the, the craft of this book, I mean, you're doing some interesting things in terms of structure, which is like my favorite thing to talk about in this podcast. So you kind of dabble in both the past and the present, there's a dual timeline going on. Um, and so when you were kind of getting to the point of, you know, finishing this book, how did you know to land on that balance between Dee Dee's past and present? Um, I didn't know. I just like, that's the thing, right? It's like, I feel like every time you start a new book, I'm, you're a beginner like every time right like even this next project I'm thinking of I might do like dual narrator and there's a piece of me that's like I don't know like I'm like how am I going to do that um but I knew that I needed to have I knew I needed to have like the past be part of um her development as a character because it does like help give people context and as far as like the pacing of it I was just like I was trying to find these moments where like I tried to think of it in terms of like a movie, right? Like that's kind of how I was envisioning it in my mind is like cinematically, like when would you have this cutscene that goes back in the past to just like provide this, like maybe this little bit of context or just like reveal a little bit more about her upbringing and like her relationship with Sloan, right? Um, and so I tried to think of it that way, but yeah, it's hard. It's hard to think about how you achieve the balance. Um, one thing, one book that really did help me was I had read The Girls by Emma Klein for like the second time because I think that she also does that where she's moving between these two timelines of it's the woman like as her future, like her adult self and then the woman experiencing her past. Even though I think in The Girls, the bulk of the narrative actually does occur in the past, you know, but that really helped me think about like, you know, what is she doing when she's moving from like these different chapters and how does she help the reader understand like how we're moving through that timeline um and that helps me a lot yeah because even like so there's there's certain sections of the book that kind of directly place you in the 90s but then also there's in the present timeline there's some moments where there's just kind of like interspersed some memories that she's having about the past that kind of inform that present and you i think it was just so brilliant how you kind of mastered that balance of like going back and doing a full kind of fleshing out of of that experience or just kind of letting the reader know a little bit about her memory or how that's kind of impacting her present experience in the narrative was just it was really cool so i just wanted to commend you for that um and Thank it's you. interesting to hear that emma klein was like part of that experience because she's one of my, my favorite writers as well so that's cool but it's amazing it's like it's sometimes so frustrating like how amazing like <laughs> the work is you know what i mean you're just like oh how does she do that yeah i mean it, that's why i have this podcast is to ask you guys how you do it because <laughs> i had i've never done it and i probably never will so um okay so i want to ask about there's so many elements here i think i want to start with just like a broad question about horror for you because mm -hmm. this book i mean i've seen it you know dubbed as body horror which i think is accurate in some regards um there is body horror going on i don't want to spoil too much about the ending again but i i want to ask you if the french film inside was a inspiration for you at all i've never seen the movie but i know about it and some of this book kind of reminded me of that um are you familiar so, with that movie i think like someone had mentioned it to me like when i was developing it and then i was like i don't want to watch it because i'm afraid of being like too influenced and being like or or I'm, i would be afraid of being like oh they've already done something like that i'm working on so i know it exists but i have not seen it yet um but I can say, interestingly, I spent like so much time before I wrote this trying to find like other, right, like media, like movies and books and stuff like about this concept. Um, but yeah, I have yet to see it. Maybe now is the time. Maybe I need to see it now. <laughs> I mean, so I've I heard about it. Like I was on Reddit like years ago and I saw people saying like extreme French horror film inside and I, I love horror and I was telling you a little bit about like my sensitivity to like bugs. <laughs> um, yeah. I think the one thing that I'm very nervous about this book, it, it has it in it, but it's not like, I don't know, it was fine for me. Um, but aside from that, like, I feel like as I've gotten older, I have a like a much stronger reaction to like gore or like in, in film, I would say. Um, so I have not seen that movie, but um, 
I would at least recommend, I don't know how sensitive you are to it, but like reading the synopsis, like I've read the summary of the movie, but that's all I need to know. It, it's, it sounds pretty wild. Um, but anyways, yeah, so there's that. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask you about like your relation to horror and how you think about it. Um, like, do you consider yourself to be like a horror writer or is it just like an influence that kind of comes in for you? So, you know, what's interesting. I never, like the, at the outset, like the very beginning of like my desire to like write novels, like I've always, you know, it's like the whole thing. Oh, I've always written. I've always written. But when I sat down and was like, I want to write like, a, like books, um, most of my influential inspirations were actually science fiction, like Octavia Butler um, and like Phil K. Dick and all that kind of, th kind of stuff. I was like, I want to be a sci-fi writer. And it wasn't until um, when I met Tom Spanbauer, who was my mentor for two years and like attended his workshop that I was kind of like, I don't want to do like the world building. Maybe that's just not the world for me. What I really love is like emotion and atmosphere. And then I kind of fell into right, like with animals and gag reflex. Um, it's all very, and even nudes, it is like, you know, real, it's like the realism, like literary fiction. Right. But, um, I've always loved horror movies as a genre. Um, and I don't know why, like, I just, I like, I can, like, I will watch, I could watch like five horror movies. Like I will go home and just like watch a horror movie. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I've seen so many of them and it wasn't until a couple of years ago where I was like, I feel like I've watched so many good and bad that like, I have a taste for it, or I know like what my taste is and I can think about it like holistically, like as this genre. Um, and so like when writing delivered me it's like I want I part of me was like I just want to write this story like from the way that I write fiction and then as I started getting deeper into it I was like um and I've always been into transgressive fiction and that sort of thing too like when I was in high school like you know I read um Invisible Monsters and Fight Club and like those books kind of changed my world too in that way but it wasn't until I think maybe during like COVID lockdowns that I was like maybe like maybe this is where I'm turning. Like, I'm just turning toward horror more. Like I do, I enjoy it so much. Like I enjoy these aspects of it. Um, I'm not familiar as like a trained writer of being like, what are the genre expectations? Like, I'm not like super familiar with that type of stuff yet, but I find myself just like moving more towards it um, and thinking about it more and kind of embracing and accepting how much I appreciate and love horror as like a media genre, like film and books. Um, and all that too, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm the same way in terms of my reading life. Like when I was growing up, I, I started reading like like most people do, like R.L. Stein Goosebumps, and then I started getting into Stephen mm -hmm. King. And I feel like even though now I don't read, I, I find myself always coming back to horror or like when I don't know what to pick up, I'm always like gravitating towards something even slightly horrific. Um, and it's something that I always think about. Like, I'm not sure why I'm so drawn to horror. Like, as, yeah. as drawn, like it's just something that, I don't know, it is, enticing and it is you know stimulating in terms of like the content that you're experiencing so maybe that's part of it for me as well um it's interesting to hear your influence on that too because i mean in this book it is you know horrific in many regards but you're also exploring many other themes here so this book is considering i mean we, we open on the book with our main character working at a meatpacking facility i was doing some research into your work and how you kind of want to focus on working class narratives and how that kind mm -hmm. of informs your books and so i just wanted to start with just her profession and how you like landed on that as her profession and how that informs like the rest of the story also again like when i when i graduated high school i read this book called um what is it called it's by eric schlosser and it inspired the movie Super Size me i think i think it's called fast food inc or something and it was like this like very it was very like this just um investigative journalism style book about the meatpacking industry and part of it focused on Colorado Springs which is where I grew up and so I was like wow this actually really does hit home I never realized that the meat industry was like this especially that industrial agriculture was like this and I've, so I've always been very like passionately against um like this this the way that large-scale farming affects not just animals but like people in the United States like meatpacking is one of the most dangerous professions um and it's throughout different parts of my life like I've maybe taken personal actions to see if I can be less involved in it like I've been vegetarian and then I stopped being vegetarian and then um when I lived in Arkansas I um I got chickens so I could have free range you know eggs that were as cruelty you know cruelty free as possible that we could make them like I've always been a proponent of that um 
but it's also like it's hard right it's not accessible when you don't make a lot of money like that kind of food does take um like you have to be in a certain class bracket I think to be able to access it um so I've always been passionate about it and then right living in Arkansas that's where the Tyson headquarters is so I was very very close to it like I knew people who worked in the industry um and even during like the it was like during like the 2016 election, there was a lot of focus on these people who, right, who were working class. They were like, why are these people voting for Trump? Like there was all this media focus on it. Um, so there was a lot of these stories in the news that um, interested me like as well, just about I was living like in kind of the rural South area. So it's like, you know, who am I living around? What are these people thinking? Like those sorts of things. So um, that is, I think, a lot of where that came from um and just really wanting to examine especially chicken like the chicken farming industry in the United States is particularly um like just awful like it's it it's when I was researching the novel I know that 140 birds per minute was like the max parameter of productivity that they were allowed to process but I think they were lobbying to increase it to like 170 and I think that that is actually it's like they're killing 170 birds per minute and so it's like you think about the capacity for a human to do like the same task with sharp objects like over and over again like it's very it's hard it's dangerous it's not very clean um I think something like 30 like I don't know the exact figure but it's like 30 percent of chicken in the United States you just should assume like has salmonella like that's just how it is like that's just how um the like the industry is because of the way that they function you know um so that is I don't know that is a lot of where it come from like it comes from it was incredibly I keep going to the word like visceral when I upon reading this because you kind of dive deep into like the detail of what's going on because she works a little bit I forget like what position she is on the assembly line I think she's like number four if I recall but she's yeah. kind of seeing the chickens at a point when they're kind of not chickens anymore and that kind of and it was interesting to see how I was thinking about like my own sort of desensitization when it comes to like meat and how I even consume meat and how easy it is to kind of just not think of it as something that was you know real um which is fucked up for i don't know lack of a better word like i should always remember that but um i don't know it, it, just, it just yeah and i i feel like I, I like turn my eyes away from it or like you know not thinking about it but it's you know very real and um something that we should be considering and i think it was interesting how in a book that's so much about you know motherhood and you know the abusive relationship at the, at the core of this how, like incorporating that was just another layer that was really interesting for me to to see in this book um thank you yeah it's like you know when you're in the supermarket too it's like it's it's easy to see how we become desensitized or that we are even as a society very sterilized from death which kind of goes back into maybe why um uh, we love horror so much too because we are so sterilized or sent you know uh from like what that death looks like well maybe not so much anymore because of the incidents of like mass shootings and stuff like that like getting so much worse but but like it is um when you see it like on a supermarket shelf it's a product it's wrapped in plastic it it doesn't have any of these proponents of what we would consider to like right be like gore or distasteful or anything it's actually like it is a meal like you create it like you create like sustenance and stuff from it so it's easy to be separated from it but it is interesting like um like it kind of I wonder like I wonder how the relationship and transformation to like food and animals comes when you can look at something and say like this came from like a living thing like if you look at like a dog or a cat that's like your pet you know and you're like can you think about like what that would look like if you were like like we have this care and reverence for it you know well like when I own chickens, it was like kind of the same, like they're, they all have like their own personalities. Like they're, they're cute. Like they, they have routines and habits, like they're animals. Um, and so it is that like, do you have more reverence for it? Do you have more like respect for it when you see it there? Right. And then it goes through this long process to, um, becoming this thing that you eat. Like, how does that change your relationship to what you're consuming? You know, tying all of this to, like why she works there and her relationship at home with daddy um her boyfriend and there's so many questions i have about daddy um he's a really interesting figure of course um but i want to you know ask just open floor for you how you came to crafting him and another thing about his character he has an insect fetish which i alluded to earlier um 
and just how their dynamic is at play in light of her, you know, working relationship and what's kind of going on from the author's side there. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of it came from this idea that like what Daisy wants more than anything is probably like a sense of liberation, right? Like everyone in the novel proselytizes to her. They're preaching to her some way to get them to come over to their side. And and part of that is this, it plays into like a power dynamic, right? It's her role in society. It's um, her sublimation to God, or it's, you know, are you going to be like the right kind of woman, right? Are you going to do the right kind of things? Are you going to listen? um it's it's all of that that comes into play and so I think that is where his character came from a lot um and that I think that's also I think why the insect fetish adds this interesting layer to it because it does create it kind of puts a laser like on the power dynamic between them like in a really specific way that you might not be as observant of if you're just looking at the way that these power dynamics play out between genders like in society you know like the first time the reader kind of sees into the insect fetish other than you know seeing that they own them in their apartment um there's kind of this exploration of his sort of grappling with his own queerness which is kind of hinted at but not you know that's kind of like the the most that we kind of get into that mm -hmm. but there's enough there to kind of raise that question and then thinking about that in light of daisy's you know relationship with sloan and how we learn more about that kind of queer narrative and that relationship and how that informs the present narrative as well. Um, I guess my question stemming from that is like how you thought to explore Daisy and Sloan's relationship and just queerness in general in this book and how much of that was like top of mind for you? Yeah, I think I'm always thinking about like queer relationships between like women as like a, a woman who loves like women very much. And so I, I think with Daisy in particular, um, one of the things that was most important to me was that she has these feelings, but she lives in like a world where she doesn't even have language for what she's feeling like, you know, like, from a religious perspective that there's something wrong and like, you know, dark there in society that she's not quite allowed to explore. So there's like the sense of oppression, but not even having like the seeing what that might look like, like in society, like she's not really allowed to watch TV and those kinds of things and um not having those particular words she's like i don't know she doesn't have words to describe like what it is other than we get that it's like a sense like of a, of obsession of some sort right like we get that there's these feelings of desire but towards what direction they go she hasn't seen a real pathway for that she's just kind of like moving towards the very like real and basic thing that all humans experience which is that you know you have desire and then you have what you don't have right the desire in between it and that desire creates suffering right and so how she explores that path was really interesting to me there's there's an interesting thing you're doing in this book that i mean she's she is suffering from a lot of you know religious trauma a lot of questioning about not having the words for certain things that she's experiencing but the book feels so like grounded in the sense of realism that even though we see her do some things that are like what are like questioning what she's doing or like wondering why she's doing certain things or like like girl don't do that kind of like <laughs> that sort of thing in the narrative like there's still this sense that it feels very real and it feels very grounded because of how you kind of intersperse her her memory and how she's kind of factoring those things into her present action if that makes sense so i guess my question for you is just about how you thought about like leaning into I guess that lack of understanding on her part and like leaning into her delusion about her understanding of herself and how you wanted to create that experience for the reader. Yeah, I I did go into the creation of this character um, with a lot of like empathy, like in my mind, like I wanted to have a lot of empathy be developed for her because um, like I've said before, one of the one of the impetuses for the creation of this novel was this fringe crime happened um, in my town in like 2015. Um, like I'd only read the headlines about it. And I was just so the thing that fascinated me most about it was just how I, I was like, how could someone, you know, go like faking a pregnancy, right? For like nine months or whatever it is um in their lives and nobody around her notices like what is happening there like the like social services and mental health services are failing this woman um her her family is like fail you know failing her her spouse is failing her like even the people closest to her had like no idea and so i was i'm just i was fascinated by um how does someone fall through the cracks like that and like why does that happen 
And um, I did a lot of research on other cases of this that had happened. Um, and like, there's, um, I'm like, I don't want to spoil it. Like, don't want to spoil it for readers or anything, but there's one particular case that recently actually did, uh, it happened in around 2004, 2005, but um, it recently picked up headlines in 2021 when um, this, uh, she had to face the death penalty for her actions, which is very, very rare for something like that to happen. And when this happened, there was all these details about like her own past and life that could, that had finally come to light that never came to light in her trial. And it was so, so sad. Like, it's just, it is a huge miscarriage of justice. And so um, I did kind of, after reading a lot of these cases, like I did go into it thinking like, you know, who is this person? How would this person live their, you know, live their lives? Um, and how, I, I don't know, I thought a lot about the development of, um, like how someone would walk into that you know and it's like even myself like I have like my own like we all have our own mental health issues and sometimes you do like you know walk into something one day where you're just like I am really like fucked up today like what is going on everything's messed up how did I get here and we all have to untangle that you know like that's still it's a very common experience it just it's just the context the context and the community around you and like all that tends to be different and it's like but I think that's where I was really coming from with it. I hope that makes sense. I feel like I'm rambling. No, yeah, it totally <laughs> does. I mean, I think it, it, it's a testament to like the, the layering. I keep going back to this sort of like layering in, in terms of all these different relationships kind of informing her her experience and how that that's what makes it feel so like real. And I and I cared for the character and it was just like, I don't know, it was hard. It was hard to watch at times. But I mean, in terms of like how you explore, I guess, diving into more of like the the theme of religion in this book and how her mom's calls to her are kind of informing her present understanding of her circumstance and how her mom is trying to you know pressure her into having a child and to getting married with um with daddy and all those things and then also we get more um more insight into her upbringing growing up in the church and like how all of those things kind of inform her experience of the present so i guess i wanted to ask you about religion in this book and how you went about like thinking about including that and just like the general i mean even going to the title deliver me two things going on there which is really clever perfect mm -hmm. title um but yeah so anything you want to say about that i spent my like my adolescent years in colorado springs which is like there's like 600 churches in that town um and it was like a pretty like it was small for a town when i when i lived there um not like super super tiny but just like you know it wasn't like metropolis or anything like that but there's a huge like evangelical influence there where I grew up um focus on the family is headquartered there I don't know if like you're familiar with it all it's just this huge religious organization where like when I was going to school um we would they would be like in our schools like we would have like focus on the family programs in our schools which is kind of insane to think about um now you know because it's like why why is that even there like why are they even coming to our schools to talk to us um and so I've always really been kind of fascinated with this particular brand of American Christianity because of its political influence, like in the United States, like it wasn't always this way. Sometime between the seventies and eighties, it somehow became linked with the Republican party. And, um, that, that in itself itself can be, it feels a little scary because, because a lot of it is about just exerting, like exerting power and stuff. Like I've always been fascinated by it. So so for me, like I have, I spent, I've spent a lot of time like reading the Bible um, and even researching like different religions. A lot of it is always fascinating to me. Like, I'm like, why are these sects different from these ones? Right. Like what, what's different from a Pentecostal Christian, um, you know, that makes them think that Catholics are Satanists. Like, why does that happen? It's really curious to me. So in part um, of that fascination is what, kind of where I built it in, you know, um, and it's, it is also one motivation too, is that I think it is easy to look at like the whole of Christianity and just be like, well, all of that is like, you know, bad for whatever reason. It's easy to like generalize it, but there's a lot of nuances that make it um, very curious and, and interesting, you know? And it's like, for me, like I am, like I am very staunchly not Christian. Like I'm, I would say I am anti, <laughs> like I am anti-Christian, but if I'm going to um be against something i really want to understand what it is and why i disagree with it to to like a detailed degree you know like i want to read the bible like i want to talk to other christians and i want to understand like what are these differences you know so 
<laughs> one thing that the one way that you're exploring that in this in this book is like this idea in terms of kind of like cult like behavior group ritual and how people you know seek salvation in the sense of like group experience or kind of how that makes people feel like they've been saved or like they have something to live for or for lack of a better word i guess and i mean in terms of you know exploring the mother daughter relationship and even the father daughter relationship um i mean how did you think about the external force of her mom as like contrasted with daddy and with sloan like where does how does the mom kind of figure for you um in, in terms of craft well i don't know i always am like why am i exploring mother-daughter relationships because it's hard <laughs> you're like your relationship with your mom's hard i guess but like i think that one thing that she really does a good job of representing is like she feels like she's left the church like she feels like she's no longer part of that world but you know i think a lot of times people can feel like they like they aren't christians but there's like puritanism still in their thoughts and their behaviors and actions like it's like christianity like puritanism puritanism is like a deeply a part of american culture and so you know she her the mom really does represent this like you you know this feeling of like you haven't escaped it yet like it's still in your behaviors it's still in your thought patterns it's still exerting control over you like you haven't been liberated yet um and it is also she to me represents how history and legacy can still like affect us in deep ways especially if we can't let go if we can't stand up to like what we're afraid of if um we fear if we inherently fear like authority in our actions like we will make these decisions like based like on fear our whole lives you know and we'll we'll never find like you'll never be able to like make the decisions that you truly want that are best for you because you're still hearkening back to, right? Like this fear of authority somehow, you know? So I think that that's, um, that's really the role that the mother plays in her, in this relationship is that she can't sever those ties. And she starts to a little bit, right? Like, I think there's a, a part in the novel where she says, the more distance I get, the more clarity like that I gain, you know? And so there is that little piece of it, but um, I'll like leave, you know, I can leave it up to the reader as far as does she find that or not. I see some similarities between how she's kind of dealing with that force of her mother, but also with daddy and even Sloan and like her kind of try her attempts to understand like the true sort of like where she kind of falls in those relationships. Like how much is she seeing is real? How much is not? How much power does she have over her daddy, for example, or Sloan? Or how much is Sloan maybe playing into her faking the pregnancy, for example? Like she's kind of unsure about that given their prior you know, their prior history when they were younger and how that's all informing. And I think that's kind of interesting how you play into kind of the mystery of that. And I mean, aside from that too, this book, this to me, this book kind of reads as like Gothic. I mean, the setting of the book is really interesting because it's kind of set mostly in this, you know, one apartment complex and the characters kind of moving in and around it. And we see her kind of leave when she goes to work and stuff, but it's very, you know, centered in this sense of setting. And it felt very, I could like see it um, in a way. And so I wanted to ask you about how you think about setting for this book um, in terms of one, like, you know, the very specific setting of the apartment complex, but also um, where this is located in America. I really feel like I don't think the story could have taken place anywhere else. And part of that is because, I mean, so I, I lived, like I lived in Northwest Arkansas for, um, for like four years. And I also, uh, when I was younger, like I lived in Georgia until I was about like nine or 10, you know, like I've lived in the South and stuff. And, but something about Northwest, Northwest Arkansas in particular is so, like beautiful like I've lived off grid like lived in the woods lived in a town of 400 people but also lived in the town where like there's the headquarters of Walmart um and I don't know it's just a really fascinating place to like experience the the um the culture and the people are um like it's just it's just different right it's not like living in a city it's it's something that when I hear people say you know they talk about flyover country or like how this part of the country doesn't matter or what have you for me I am like no I think like I think it does you know to me it does there's people here who like like live and love and die every day and there's um just very interesting stories here you know um another part of my motivation we were talking about like the working class narrative is that like I think part Part of it is coming from a place like Colorado Springs or like Northwest Arkansas and seeing when you see or you only have access to like what is mainstream media, like really big books that make it 
a lot of times I felt like the books that were getting the most attention were like their coastal books, you know, like they take place in like New York or Los Angeles, you know, or Hollywood or something, which is great. Like, it's nice to have that as like fantasy and escape. But I also was like, I want to read something that feels like close to my experiences, but that also isn't like where the crawdads sing. You know, you know what I mean? Um, and so that was a big part of my motivation for that is too, is like, I just, I want to see like these narratives because like I've lived here, um, you know. You now live in Scotland. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, since moving, like, have you felt that change of like setting or where you live? Has that informed the way that you write? I don't know yet. That is a really good question. I guess it remains to be seen. Um, like in terms of style, like my style will probably be the same I don't know like we'll see, like we'll see I'm starting a doctorate program um in October and I'm really excited to work with the supervisors that I have so I'm I'm just curious to see right like how how will I like evolve from that but they also say that like you can never write about a place until you leave it and like I've left a lot behind and there's still like a lot there I think to um to think about you know so so who knows i don't know we'll see it remains to be seen i'm sure it will like affect me some you know somehow like i'm like a sponge i kind of like soak up everything that i'm in so i don't know i'm kind of like influenced by the surrounding that i'm in when i'm reading a book even if it's just like going to like a park or something and how that can like fundamentally change the way that i'm like reading a book if that makes sense or like i don't know so i'm just always curious when writers you know move or if they're especially like a big move like that like do they do you feel like a different writer when you're there or like what have you um or is it more kind of like a focus experience where you're kind of the writing is a little bit separate from what you're like living, you know, but I think it's all kind of fused in a interesting way in terms of just life, but <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I don't know. It's, there's two things. And one is that I think that change is always like really good for the creative mind, like consistently like changing. And so I do that. I think it that helps with like inspiration and just having more experience, like helps you like foment like ideas or deepen your understanding like of humanity in any way. So like there's, that's one aspect. So it's like, you could say that in and of itself, like will be influential. And then, yeah, I do think it's just, it's just by nature of like, how we observe and like what it is that we observe and what we find like interesting enough to make note of it somehow you know and the best way to do that is um right like a, you know like a change of scenery like I remember when I first moved to Glasgow I was like taking photos of all the architecture like these they have really unique um tenement buildings that there's it's just very like unique to Glasgow itself but you know, people are on the street are like, this woman is just taking photos of people's apartments. Like, that's all it is. Like, people just live there, you know, but I'm like, it's so beautiful. And then like, you know, flying into Seattle, I'm like, whoa, there's like, there's gas stations. And there's like, I don't know, there's like a Target, like, these are things like I haven't seen, even though like, I've obviously been like intimately familiar with it. But I'm for some reason, it's like, because the scenery, I haven't been back in the States for almost two years. And so I'm like, whoa, all this is like novel. And, and like, it's like new, you know, so I'm like spending more time observing it. So I think that kind of plays into it as well. You know, I know you're now in Seattle and you're about to go on book tour. And I just wanted to ask you, you know, how you're doing. Like, how does it feel, you know, <laughs> going on tour and like doing press for this book and talking about it publicly? Like, do you have a good, like, what's your relationship with, I guess, talking about your work rather than being immersed in it yourself as a writer? Um, It's fun. It's nice, actually. Like, it's, I think what's good about it is that it's hard to believe that I have worked on this book since like 2018 or 2019 and to now be like oh it's like oh in the world like people are actually gonna be like reading it and I'm like it's it's that thing where I'm super nervous because part of me is like I want people to like it and I want a lot of people to read it and I want people to like like get it like that that gets really nerve-wracking um because that's the like eternal writer thing where you're like am I seeking validation for this? Probably like in some way <laughs> or else why else would you work on the same project for four years? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but also it's, I'm really grateful too, just to like have the opportunity because, you know, my, with my early stuff, like I couldn't always go on tour or, um, you know, the opportunity just didn't present itself. Um, or like, I don't know, it's like, you come from the indie world. Like you just kind of like, um, you do stuff and like, you just who you, you know you never know like how it will land so I do just feel grateful that people are interested in it and that 
people um like want to talk to me about it you know like that is really exciting um and I always love like really good interview questions because like you have asked me things that I'm like I don't know I've never thought about like the mother's place in the novel before but now I'm gonna have to because I have to give you a smart answer but but then I'm like oh no maybe that is what I was doing like I it's it it makes me think about my work in a deeper way than um than I hadn't thought of like when I was explicitly like just in it and creating it so um yeah I'm just I'm grateful for those kinds of opportunities for sure yeah I mean I'm, I'm so glad to you know be a part of it because I find as a reader like I've been doing a lot of self questioning over the last like year. I'm like, why am I doing this podcast? Like, why am I interviewing authors? Like, what is going on there? But I do think that like half, of, I would say maybe half of like my experience of reading comes from like the joy of talking with people about books and like whether it's on Bookstagram, um, on YouTube, finding people that read similarly, or now talking to authors. Like, it's so much. There's so much like I think that's generative about kind of unpacking things verbally, which it can be hard sometimes, even like coming up with questions or the right way to ask something about the book, because there's so much at work to like do it justice in an hour is very hard. But um, I don't know, I don't know, what I'm, I'm rambling now, but I'm just it's in interesting to hear how authors think about, you know, talking about their work when so much of it is already contained in, you know, the item, which is the book. So um, I guess I'm saying all that to say thank you for coming on and, you know, letting me <laughs> ask you about all of this, because it's, it's, I don't know, it's scary. It still scares me, even though I'm like, almost 50 authors in now. I don't, do you still feel like nervous about it at all? Or do you kind of just like having fun with it? No, I totally like the idea of um, being like in front of people, like having my readings where people are going to ask me questions live and then I'm going to have to answer is like a little bit, it's always nerve wracking. But um, I also try to um, compartmentalize a lot. Like it just like, I like I used to be this person that had, I, I mean, I still do like have extreme stage fright where it's like, the idea of like having to go up and do something blind yeah that always does freak me out a little but I guess the nice thing is that because it's a book I have like the thing in front of me and I can read it and I'm not gonna like forget all my lines or something <laughs> you know what I mean but no I feel that way too because I interview I interview people for the creative independent a lot it's like I do love having the opportunity to be like I have watched this movie and this movie is so badass that like I need to talk to the person who wrote it and then I do, I tend to do this thing where like I do fangirl too much and I get nervous, like talking to them about it. And I'm like, oh, I hope they don't think I'm insane. But it's always like, I think it's just, it's fun to, to be able to talk about it and like figure out how people do what they do. Like, I totally understand that, that drive. Cause it's, I don't know, it's interesting, you know? So I will have two more questions for you, you mm -hmm. know, kind of in the spirit of like October and Halloween with this book coming out. Um, First question is like, what are your hol I know you're like on book tour, but do you have any like mm -hmm. rituals or like any movies that you want to watch during the season or books you want to read coming up? Yeah, I um I wrote down a list. So the, like the problem is, is that I watch horror so much that I'm like, what have I what have I not seen yet? So I did write down like this big list of stuff that I want to watch throughout October. And then um I have a daughter, so we're definitely have to do trick-or-treating this year because we did not go last year um because I wasn't sure if people did do trick-or-treating in Scotland like I don't think it's as big I think it's like an explicitly American thing so I was a little bit like I have social anxiety and I don't want to just go knock on people's doors <laughs> like I live in like a building so no one you know I'm like no one's gonna come in it's like a secured building so but I think I have to because she is six and she is ready to have this cultural experience um and so we're gonna go do that as well um, and then as far as books, I am making time to read is so hard lately, but I do have, um, I run goth book club. And so, um, we will be reading Thomas More's Your Dreams, which isn't horror, but it's like about human feelings. And so that is a little bit horrifying, you know, it works. And then, um, also Charlene Elsby, which she wrote, a new novel called the devil thinks i'm pretty out from apocalypse party and so that is also like a goth book club pick coming up too which i'm really really excited about she's one of like in my opinion the like most clever writers like living today she has this novel coming out called violent faculties with clash next year and i got to read an early version of it and it's like you know when you just read something and you're just like this is it you know 
Like that's how that book like felt for me. So yeah, I mean that's that's really cool. Right? Clash is quick shout out to Clash because that's how I, I found Gag Reflex on Clash. Um, I think they're publishing such cool stuff, and they also published um, Anybody Home, which is another mm -hmm. one that I really loved. Um, mm -hmm. They're publishing great stuff. So that's I don't know. I have to check that out now. So it comes out next year. You said is that right? <laughs> It comes out, I think, um, in the early part of next year called Violent Faculties. Yeah. And okay. um, I know I Clash is so cool. They, I feel like they've really found a good niche because, you know, it's like with mainstream publishing, they may not take on like the risk, right, of like, like weirder books. But I think Clash is showing people that, no, you can, you can invest in these. There is a market for like the weird shit, you know, like the cool shit. So. And I guess the last question, I know you just gave some book recommendations, but in terms of like the creation of deliver me or just you as a writer like do you have any books that feel like staples of like al nash's reading journey to now books that formed me that like made me want to be a writer was um i talked about invisible monsters with chuck palniak um and even his like his early writing journey was really inspirational for me as a person too because invisible monsters was his first book but it didn't come out because it didn't get picked up by anybody um fight club was the one that came out first and then um there's Francesca Leah Block. She wrote like Violet and Claire. And she also wrote like the Dangerous Angel series. And um, it is very, it is YA, but it was like one of, along with Palniuk, it was like one of the first places that I'd seen like queer characters that where, where it wasn't just like this, you know, then there's like, there's like the coming out narrative, but then there's also like, we're just like queer and this is what we do when we have like our normal lives. That was like, how it was with um, Francesca Lea Block's work, where it was just like, no, this is like, it's normalized. Like we're just like people. And that was, um, um, that was really important for me to have. And also like her prose is really like sweet. It's almost like the experience is like eating cotton candy, but like in the best way, like in the most sensory way. And then Another one was Wasted by Maria Hornbacher. That's a memoir about her eating disorder, which came out in like her early 20s. Um, but that made me feel really seen. And like I got my like degree in journalism. Like I thought that was kind of the direction I wanted to go with like nonfiction. And so that was one of those things where I was like, oh, maybe I could do stuff like this. You know, it was like really forming for me. So formative not forming formative <laughs> yeah i feel like your work is drawing from so much so it's always cool to hear i don't know good uh, book recommendations from cool people like yourself so thank you for sharing those and I, so i guess i'll i'll end it here l uh, thank you so much for for joining me to talk about deliver me i think it's so good thank you thank you thank you thank you so much i appreciate that mm -hmm.